So thank you. Um, I want to thank the organizers of the summit, and I particularly want to thank all of you who came here today. There is such a vast discrepancy between the likely effects of climate change on health, on the one hand, and the attention and awareness to those issues on the other hand. So I'm just thrilled to see that people, so many people are paying attention to them and, and working to bring further attention to these health consequences. I think it's particularly important for us to pay, to, to talk about the health impacts of climate change. I want to highlight three reasons for that. One is, of course, that you need to understand what the impacts are going to be in order to prepare for them. But there's also a carry-on effect of that, which is one of the reasons that people don't think as much as they should about climate change uh, can be that it seems so, so sort of vast and intangible and scary. Um, and so we, as a, as a species, have a long record of not thinking about things that are too scary to think about. Um, if we start to identify specific aspects and think about how to prepare for them, that gives people the sense that, yes, this is, this is a problem. We can cope with it. We can do something about it. And it might uh, have this carry-on effect where people are, in fact, more willing to, um, to just have climate change as an issue of discussion. Then beyond preparing for them, there's, of course, the issue of just understanding them. And another aspect of climate change uh, that kind of gets in the way of people's thinking about it is that it seems very remote. An earlier speaker made this point. It seems like something that's happening in the future, in other places, to other people. And uh, talking about health impacts can make it seem much more personally relevant. So that will encourage people to pay attention. And then third, the way we talk about climate change um, in this country, certainly, and in some other countries as well, is very, it's very partisan, it's very compartmentalized, and it's divided by ideology. Um, not just political ideology, sometimes religious ideology, or maybe just how you feel about the free market system. But uh, research actually shows that people are very responsive to messages that are framed around health. We can all agree about health, regardless of where we are in the political spectrum. So that makes it more politically palatable to talk about climate change. So how is it that climate change, um, which is this big geophysical phenomenon, can affect what's inside here? And I think that's something that uh, a lot of people have trouble grasping. And I want to focus most of my comments today on that very question. But first, I want to acknowledge that it's a very complex relationship. The ways in which climate change can affect our mental well-being are multi-layered. And so some of those distinctions that they describe are, for example, climate change can have direct effects, but it can also have indirect effects. So a direct effect might be if your home is flooded in a hurricane, you are directly affected. Um, if some of the other people's homes in your neighborhood are flooded and thereby uh, insurance rates go up or policies change to prevent certain kinds of building practices in ways that affect you, that could be an indirect effect of climate change. There are also both acute and gradual changes. Um, if you're affected by a flood due to a hurricane, that's an acute effect. If over the years and even the decades, rising sea level gradually erodes your property, your beachfront property, and it disappears into the ocean, that's a more gradual change. And then a third distinction is that we, we can experience the, effect, the effects of climate change. Um, some people already are, certainly. But even when we don't experience them personally, we think about them. We're affected by our perceptions of climate change. So my home may not be flooded, but if I'm aware that more and more people are experiencing effects of um, natural disasters, I might be aware of it, I might worry about the extent to which it will affect me, and that can have an impact on my mental health. So to get at some of this complexity, I have a, a diagram here that actually came from a report uh, prepared by Eco America, which is available online, and um, the reference is available uh, in these slides. So we start with the physical impacts of climate change. These have been fairly thoroughly described today. Um, we know what these are. They've been predicted for us by the climatologists. They're in the IPCC report. Um, things like wildfires, drought, flooding, changing temperatures, rising sea levels, increased um, intense weather events, and changing growing seasons due to changing patterns of precipitation. These physical effects of climate change then affect the human systems and infrastructure, and that can include very concrete aspects of our infrastructure, our transportation systems, our energy provi uh, providing systems, our cell phone coverage, um, 
It can also affect food security and economic security and human security. So these are very important. And both the physical effects and the human systems effects can then go on to affect human well-being. So both the direct and the indirect effects. And in this diagram, you see distinguished mental health, physical health, and community health, um, but there are errors between them. And I am sure that most, if not all of you, recognize the connections between mental and physical and community well-being. So I really want to think about that concept of well-being more broadly. Um, people who are mentally, who have a mental illness, um, are in many cases more susceptible to physical illness. Community health is certainly going to have an impact on both mental health and physical health. And of course, having uh, mental health and physical health issues will affect the, the community as well. So all of that's going on. So what are some of the direct effects on mental health? Well, kind of uh, the, the exact things you would expect. Um, things associated with trauma, things associated with stress, things associated uh, with grief, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, for example. Mental problems that are consequent from experiencing this stressful traumatic event. Depression. Domestic abuse, which I acknowledge is not actually a mental health problem, but it certainly contributes to mental health problems and is also um, probably contributed to by mental health problems. Generalized anxiety. Suicide. Thinking about suicide. Complicated grief. Uh, this is a diagnosis, it's a little bit controversial, but the idea is that it's normal to grieve. We grieve when we lose something important to us or someone important to us. But that, um, so again, it could be a, the loss of a loved one, it could be the loss of a property. But that for some people, this grief persists, it is stronger than you would expect, it lasts longer than you would expect, and it really interferes with their ability to live their lives, which is um, the definition of really, of mental illness, that you are no longer able to function effectively and be reasonably uh, content. And substance abuse. And all of these things manifest not just necessarily in the days or weeks or months after a, an extreme weather event, but potentially um, several years or more following. So how do we know this? I, I think it's important to say that most of the time you can't say climate change itself has contributed to the following increase in any particular problem. But we know because we know the effects of natural disasters, and then we know that natural disasters are more likely, are likely to increase uh, due to climate change. So Hurricane Katrina has been well studied. Um, there was a 49% incidence of anxiety or mood disorders in people who had lived through Hurricane Katrina and one in six developed post-traumatic stress disorder. But then there are the indirect effects, the sort of more slowly emerging, in some cases, effects. After you have lived through a natural disaster, the economic system is disrupted. You may lose your job, perhaps because um, your job was directly connected to, uh, to the environment. Maybe you were a fisher or a farmer or in the tourism industry or maybe the, just the manufacturing plants have shut down because of um, the overall effects, or the hospitals have closed because all of their equipment was flooded. Um, so damage to physical and social infrastructure, um, and environmental degradation, flooding, sometimes the land is, um, is contaminated by an event, it becomes salinated from the seawater. And all of these things, in addition to being disruptive, um, may require people to move. And migration due to climate change is a big problem. And we know that it's very disruptive and is a very serious stressor for human beings, um, strong effects on mental health. And just to show you that these indirect effects have a big effect, um, some of these data come from Munich Re, which uh, someone else had already mentioned this morning. Last year, natural disasters cost $25 billion just in the US and uh, 110 worldwide and 19 million people were displaced worldwide. Now these figures include some things that are definitely not associated with climate change. They include, for example, uh, earthquakes. But they don't include some of the more subtle, gradual changes that are due to climate change. So they don't necessarily include things like drought and, um, and flooding and wildfires uh, that are more slow, but in the long run will actually have a more significant economic impact and a more significant impact on displacing people. 
So moving beyond that idea of immediate experience of disaster or environmental change, I want to talk about um, some of the broader effects on how we think about um, how we think about things in ways that have implications for our mental health. And I want to identify three components or three important ways in which our, our, our thinking might be different. One is the way in which we think about ourselves. So a strong sense of self is an important buffer uh, that allows us to cope with life stressors. But our sense of self, much as we might like to think of it, is not something that is consistent from one situation to the next. It's tied to other things. It's tied to our, our routine habits, our cultures, our occupations, um, and our place. We form very strong ties often to a specific place. Um, when we have to move, we talk about being uprooted. Our roots are torn out from the ground. We often define ourselves very much in terms of our occupation. So if we lose our job, that sense of self is, is, is gone or is vulnerable. We may define ourselves in part through our routine cultural practices, the kinds of things we do, um, whether it's going fishing or ways in which we interact with the natural world that are part of what we have culturally learned. And these are already changing. Uh, changing excuse me. There were some studies of indigenous peoples in Canada that have shown that they are already being affected by climate change. They can't engage with nature the way they used to That was in ways that were culturally significant to them. And people in the community blame that for things like increased substance abuse and increased uh, mental health issues. Most of us may think, well, we're not indigenous. You know, We don't relate to the natural environment in the same way, but even our lifestyles and cultures are going to be changed. Um, I've seen references, for example, to things like coffee or wine or chocolate becoming you know, harder to get, more difficult, um, more expensive due to changing growing patterns associated with climate change. So our cultures may also be changed. So your sense of yourself may be very shaky, and that puts you in a place where you have fewer resources to draw on to cope with everyday life stresses. There's also shifts in the way we think about other people. So one of the things about climate change is that it can really weaken social ties, especially when migrations are involved. Because when you migrate, you don't, the whole community, all your friends and family, you don't all get up and move together. People disperse as they migrate. So the people that you relied upon for help um, and just for companionship might not be there. The term for these connections we have to have other people is often described as social capital. And that term is used because it actually is a source of resources that allows us to get things done. It's, it's kind of capital equivalent to economic capital. Um, social support is a huge predictor of, in fact, physical health, morbidity, and mortality um, on a par with whether or not you smoke um, is having strong social support. So the weakened social ties associated with, with migration uh, or with other responses to climate change can have a serious health impact. And uh, some of those other consequences are increases in conflict that are associated with climate change due to increased competition over resources or perhaps over places to live. And I think we can see right now in Europe, you know, what happens when people migrate, they are going someplace else and the people there are receiving them and that can lead to conflict. But a third thing that, um, that we think about that's a little bit more amorphous is the idea that we think about the land and the environment in ways that matter to us. And there's an Australian philosopher, Glenn Albrecht, who coined the term solastalgia, by which he meant the loss of solace and comfort from the natural world. And it sounds maybe a, a little you know, vague and, and high level, but the fact is that a lot of people have, a, I think, an instinctive sadness and grief they feel when they see something like um, a hillside full of dead pine trees or a field in which everything is dry and dead and the, and the earth is cracked, or an open pit mine. And in fact, that feeling of sadness, that feeling that you have lost something you valued, is associated with clinically significant levels of distress, um, increased hospitalization rates, even setting aside the economic consequences of those, that environmental degradation. So it is a source of potential solace to us that might be changed. Of course, beyond that, um, there's just the uncertainty that climate change involves. And here's where we move beyond sort of the actual experience to our perceptions of climate change. Nobody knows what it's really going to look like. We don't know 
when things are going to change, by how much and who will be affected. And people really like to have a feeling of control and predictability in their lives. So if they don't have that feeling of predictability, they become anxious. And this unpredictability actually also opens the door for more intergroup tensions as people contest what particular events mean. So, gee, it was a cold winter last year. Does that mean there is no climate change? It was a warm summer this year. Does that mean there is climate change? So I know we've all seen some of those arguments that are playing out in the public discourse. There's also intergroup tension over perceived inequity. And it can be inequity in who's experiencing the brunt of climate change, you know, which groups are more likely to suffer, and it can be inequity in who has to be responsible for dealing with it, you know, who needs to put up um, more of the money to cope with some of these effects. And of course, to the extent that you really feel um, that the future is uncertain and maybe even not very bright, um, there's a hopelessness, and of course, when you really become hopeless, you stop doing anything to take care of yourself. So. There's a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy effect that if you feel that there's nothing you can do, well, you won't do it. And that's true at a global sense in terms of acting to address climate change. And it's also true at a more local sense in the sense of eating healthy foods. You know, why should I eat healthy foods? Why should I exercise? The world's coming to an end anyway. Um, so very direct physical health effects there. As I've been saying this, a lot of us are probably thinking, well, these effects are not going to, I'm not going to feel these effects. Um, and it is absolutely true that the effects of climate change are not evenly distributed. There are people at greater risk, and what it boils down to is that those who are at greater risk are the people who are already experiencing other stressors, which could be pre-existing mental health conditions or other health conditions, or it could mean being stigmatized and marginalized in the community, and also people who have fewer resources to cope with the stress of, of climate change. And so I want to um, particularly highlight the question of children for a minute. Children are especially vulnerable to climate change um, in both physical and mental health ways. Um, certainly, they're more physically vulnerable. I think probably you all recognize that the developing body and the developing brain are more susceptible to injury from external events. Um, so being, as you're still developing, disease hits harder. Persistent stress hits harder. Malnutrition hits harder and more permanently. People who did not get enough to eat when they were growing up are never going to be as tall as people who did get enough to eat. So these effects are in some cases um, irreversible. And of course, there are carry-on effects as being stressed due to um, uh, these kinds of uncertainties and tensions as well as not having enough to eat and not having clean water makes the body more vulnerable to other diseases. We know that you know, stress weakens your immune system so you're more likely to contract these infectious diseases. Children are also more socially vulnerable in the, in the sense that they really depend on the social environment to provide them with what they need. Um, and the education system, I think, is the most obvious example of this. But um, there are other ways in which children utilize social services that are absolutely fundamental to them. And climate change, whether it be through natural disasters or through migrations, can severely disrupt the educational processes. And then finally, children are more psychologically vulnerable because they really depend on other people for almost everything. They can't kind of go out and fend for themselves and provide, themsel provide for themselves. <coughs> Excuse me. And not only do they kind of directly need other people to provide their food and shelter, they also need to develop a sense of security. This is one of their developmental tasks. If you don't develop at least some assurance that you can count on people to provide you with what you need. You can count on people to stay there. You can count on your home to remain in existence. Um, that lack of security can continue to affect you at a psychological level um, as, you, as you age and as you become an adult in ways, again, that can be almost irreversible. Of course, these effects are going to depend on the child's um, developmental stage as well as the sources of resilience they have available to them. So I want to make the very important point that there are things we can do to promote resilience among children and among all of us. Um, and to kind of get right to the most important point, these things have been associated with resilience with um, being less likely to develop mental problems in the wake of natural disasters and uh, uh, environmental degradation. And the first is practical support. 
I would never want to overlook the importance of practical support. You know, being able to get clean water, being able to get food and shelter and medical care. Um, these are going to be hugely instrumental in helping people to not develop PTSD and anxiety and depression. But community ties are almost equally important, having connections to others. And then uh, at a psychological level, having that sort of inner resilience that comes with a sense of optimism about the future. So in order to promote these kinds of resilience, I think we need to, A, plan ahead. And something we've been very bad at doing so far um, as, a, as a culture and as a, as a species, planning ahead for how to cope with climate change. It's, it's a big problem, but it's a problem um, that we can turn our attention towards and we can address. And, uh, but we can only do so effectively by thinking about it. Part of that planning could lead to establishing an infrastructure that will encourage adaptation. So not just encouraging survival, but encouraging people to change ahead of time in a way that will make them more resilient to the kinds of changes that climate change will bring. This might mean uh, moving your place of residence so you're not by the seaside. It could mean changing your planting practices if you're a farmer. It could mean, um, if you're a business owner, finding ways to use less energy. So there are changes we can make ahead of time that will um, provide a buffer to climate change. We certainly want to strengthen social networks. And you can do that. Uh, the previous session, somebody asked about working with religious organizations. That's one way to do it. Work with um, community groups, religious groups, school groups, um, maybe local book groups. Um, establish a mechanism where people check on their neighbors in the case of a natural disaster, so there's just more social resources there to draw on. And people know, for example, if there's an emergency, where do they go for information? Where do they go um, to find out what's happening? Um, and that should include awareness that people who are suffering from mental illness or other kinds of illness are going to need access to medical care, so those resources have to be, have to be mindful about those people. To educate people, um, obviously very important, so people know what to expect, which not only tells them what to expect and helps them to prepare, but actually will encourage a sense of efficacy, because they can feel more prepared for what lies ahead. And so that will, in turn, contribute that, to that feeling of optimism that, yes, I know there are, some, there are some challenges, but I also feel confident that we can cope with them. And I want to um, just take a minute to say that Although we do talk a lot about gloom and tomb, there's some research to suggest that uh, experiencing a very difficult event can also be an occasion for growth. Um, and it's particularly an occasion, people talk about having experienced these things um, leading to a greater sense of meaning. And I actually brought a couple of quotes from survivors um, of Hurricane Sandy, uh, just read you very quickly. Uh, one person said, we learned firsthand that the best way to heal from devastation and loss was to help others recover. And another one said, it's a cliche, but there's no place like home. Our community came together, and it was amazing. So people do talk about actual increases in social bonds following natural disasters if there's the opportunities for people to work together. And um, something that you may find if you, as you work uh, in your health practices, uh, people who face a serious health challenge often talk about learning to appreciate life, learning what really matters to them. The same thing can be true after a natural disaster. So mental health is not just about not being mentally ill. It's about, we really want to think about a world in which people can not just survive but thrive. And um, climate change, I think, gives us an opportunity to move towards a society in which we have a more proactive, positive sense of well-being. Because we will have to change our practices in some ways. We will have to change our policies. Um, and we can think about ways to create societies in which people are more engaged. They do have healthier lifestyles. They do find sources of meaning and social connection. And what you can do, here's um, a few things that are, are probably fairly obvious, but I really want to highlight numbers one and four. Um, one is communicate with others. I think a lot of times people feel like, oh, what can I do? There's not much I can do as an individual, or what I can do may be too difficult and I don't want to do it. But just talking to other people um, is very important because we have right now a, a state of, I think, collective ignorance. 
uh, about climate change. And this is, this, a similar phenomenon has been shown in psychological research, where if you don't quite know what's happening, and whether we're facing an emergency or not facing an emergency, you look at other people and you say, well, what are they doing? Well, they don't seem too worried, so I guess there's nothing to be worried about, so I don't need to worry either. And meanwhile, the other people are looking at you and they're seeing that you're not doing anything, so they're not worried. So we're all looking at each other and nobody's doing anything. So to the extent that one person does something and one person looks worried and one person says, this is an issue we need to talk about, that in fact can break that problem of social ignorance and start the conversation in ways that can ultimately have a very powerful effect. And so uh, the last thing I'll say is just that fourth point, that the way to have an impact is to coordinate with others. Um, you can have an impact as an individual. You can have an even greater impact if you work with groups and with organizations and so that we can create a stronger public voice about climate change. Thank you. Thank you.